right there at Northport Church of God. God's got a great word that he's put right in my heart that's ministering to me right now, and I can't wait to share it with you. We as women, we have lots of things on our plates, and I know that Sunday night, there's going to be lots of things that you feel like you need to do. Maybe wash clothes, make school lunches, catch up on your favorite shows, but no, we're going to push that aside, and we're going to go ahead and press into him because he's got a calling for you, and he's got things for each of us to accomplish in our lives, and we need times like this. Hear from his spirit and stir the ladies you know, and guys, you can come, you know, I don't blame you for wanting to be a part, but we look forward to a mighty move of his spirit. I hope to see you there. I look forward to meeting each and every one of you. God bless and have a great week.
What a wonderful day it is to be in the house of God. My name is Stephen. And I am Keisha, and we are the college and career pastors here. We, we do the Summit Church of God, uh, the college and career. We are so excited about what God's doing today, aren't y'all? The Bible proclaims this blessing over us in uh, Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. This is Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. Keisha, you think it would be all right if I said just a little bit more about this? Go for it. All right. This just brings to, to my memory and, uh, and just to my spirit the, the doctrine of justification. Here, and I, I just want you to, to visualize yourself in, in a courtroom. And the judge, you're guilty. You, you did exactly what it is that, that has been raised against you. You're, you're guilty of it all. But then in, in walks Jesus. And he, and he proclaims, he, he sets the propitiation, he makes the payment. The blood is being spilt and it covers you all of a sudden. All of a sudden it covers you and the payment has been made. That, that is justification where, where my guilt is being covered by the Father. Where, where Jesus Christ says, it's no longer, you're no longer guilty. You're no longer unworthy because my blood covers you. And, and you know, God is, God is pleased in himself. When, when Jesus was baptized, uh, the, the spirit descended on him like a dove. And, he, and, God, and the voice come from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So when that, when that precious blood, when that, when that beloved blood covers me, Christ looks at you, God turns his face towards me and he sees Christ in me. And he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Go ahead, mama. I don't really know how I can follow that, but if you are a first time attender, if you would look in the seat backs in front of you, you will see one of these welcome cards. If you would please fill that out and take it to the foyer after this service, we would love to meet with you and give you a gift. We would just like to thank you for being here with us today. Also, where are my ladies at this morning? Okay, no, let's, let's do a little bit later, better than that. Where are my ladies at this morning? Much better. As you may have seen on the video, we are having Awaken 2020. It is Sunday, the 29th at 530. We will have a special guest speaker, Miss Pam Baker from City Church of Gaston. We would love for you all to come out and attend with us. We will have a time of worship and a word. And this will just be a great opportunity, women, for us to get together. And it will be a time of fellowship where we can praise Jesus. So I really encourage you, if you can, to please, please attend. And one quick reminder, the church offices will be closed this week due to spring break. Let us pray. Father, we love you and we praise you this morning. We are so thankful for the opportunity that we have to come and to be in your house amongst your people and one mind and one accord to give you all the praise and the honor and the glory that's due to you this morning, Father. And Lord, we're so thankful for the proclamation of your word that says that you will bless us, but you didn't stop there. You said that you would keep us as well. We don't look to this world for security. We don't look to this world for, for provisions, for joy, for peace. God, we, we look for you. You are our source. You are the healer. You are the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the in, the first and the last, the root, the seed of David, the bright and morning star, the rose of Sharon. God, you are the God who was, who is, and who is to come. And we're just so thankful for you and who you are today. And Lord, we pray for Pastor Kyle and this choir as they lead us into worship this morning, Lord. And we pray for Pastor Greg as he preaches the gospel of truth. In Jesus' name, amen. praise him today. I said, are you ready to praise the Lord today, church? I saw the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from every fear. Those who look on Come on. 
every day and night never end in praise may our incense rise today in this house, Lord. We exalt you today in this house, Lord. Oh, I want to say that again. Magnify the Lord with me. Come on, say it. Come exalt his name together.
you in the name of Jesus as you're being seated. Uh, it's an awesome opportunity that we have to worship with you here today at Northport Church. Pastor Stephen and Keisha, they've been up here uh, greeting you already. I want to reiterate to you that uh, heartfelt welcome to each of you. We're so glad that you chose to be with us today. Um, I want to mention for just a moment before the ushers come to serve you. Uh, obviously, the pandemic that is plaguing our planet it's threatening on every hand so I want you to be assured that we are uh, carefully observing what uh, information that we're given and we're operating by facts and uh, you know at the end of the day that's where we have to stand so by the facts we realize that there are dangers for uh, different uh, well, I don't really know how to say it the best I can say it. I know there's dangers for uh, different age demographics, maybe some more than others, but here's the facts of the business. We're making precautions, and the, what we're doing in our precautions is we are uh, cleaning the doorknobs, door handles, uh, water uh, spigots. We're doing everything that we can to make sure that uh, you have a safe environment. There are um, hand sanitizers out at each door and we ask that you are careful and you use that as much as possible when you're here on the campus and uh, just remain uh, calm trust God and know that he has never ever failed amen so um, uh, we are also being cautious we're not shaking hands and hugging necks as we usually are around here we're trying to uh, give everybody a little bit of space so that uh, we're not going to be uh, promoting and sharing that sickness. And one of the ways that we're doing that outside of not shaking hands and not hugging necks and all that fun stuff is that uh, I'm, I'm simply asking of you as your pastor, if you've been having flu-like symptoms, if you've been running fever, if you've been having that cough and uh, the other uh, symptoms that's been mentioned I'd like for you to please stay at home amen stay at home we love you and we want you to be here but we want you to be healthy and be here because um, we're asking that uh, you know we, we, we do our due diligence we're going to be people of faith we're not going to operate in fear but even when this pandemic isn't going on. We need to be courteous to those around us. If you've been having these symptoms or someone in your house has been having them, I'd like for that to have been cleared up anywhere from 24 to 48 hours before you come back on campus, if you don't mind. Uh, we want to love you and pray for you. Uh, we're not asking that you do without worship. In fact, something I've been preaching most of my ministry Worship begins at home. Amen. Worship does begin at home. And uh, we are offering our live feed. In fact, right now we're live uh, sharing this broadcast to everyone who follows our Facebook page. If you're not on Facebook, that's fine. You can go to our church website, which is thencog.com. You're seeing that there's been a lot of new updates done to our website. And you should be able to navigate through the website to find... Um, where you can watch us live right here on Sundays at 11 a.m. And as long as we are permitted uh, and we're not put under some type of quarantine where we cannot have this, this gathering, we're going to have church. I just ask you to be cautious, be prayerful and mindful, amen, and full of faith, believing that God is still God and he's still able, amen. So um, keep that in mind. Know that your pastor is praying for you. The staff and I were working hard to make sure that uh, we have people in place to care for you in uh, any situation that we may be able to. 
Now at this time, I'm going to ask the ushers to come, and we're going to demonstrate to you another way that we're trying to care for you, and that is instead of us passing the offering plate so that everyone in the house gets to touch it, we're going to do what the scripture says. It says, bring your tithes into the storehouse. Amen? I'm going to focus on the word bring. I'm going to encourage you to bring your tithe and, and just drop it in the offering plate once we get done with our prayer. And let's offer our tithes and offering to God. Amen? So uh, in just a moment, I'm going to let you do that. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we've had uh, to come to your house just to worship and to praise you. We thank you for your spirit that is so real in this house. God, I'm mindful of that, and, and, and we're always uh, in wonder and awe of your presence. So we ask that in your presence that you receive these gifts, the tithe and the offerings. We ask that you bless each one that has to give and those that do not. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you worship with me in your giving? The Lord bless you.
praise this morning. Amen. Let's honor the Lord. Let's give him a clap offering. Amen. Let's honor him. Let's give the Lord applause. He kept us all week. Amen. He's been for us. And if he's for us, who in the world can be against us? Can I get a witness this morning? Amen. Now, um, if you uh, don't mind, I've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. So I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Revelation. Look all the way to chapters number 19. Revelation chapter 19. I, I do want to make this statement too for those that are watching online. You can give online. Um, I should have mentioned this earlier. That is other options to give if you're not able to come. And you're here or you're watching online, you can go uh, to our website, which is dncog.com. And uh, you can follow the step-by-step uh, -step guide that is on those pages that will show you how to uh, download the Tithely app and uh, get connected so that you can uh, be faithful in your giving and support to the local ministry. We do appreciate your faithfulness in that manner. Amen? Now, if you uh, have your Bibles open with me to Revelation chapter number 19, I want to read to you starting at verse 11. Revelation 19, starting at verse 11. <clears throat> the scripture says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and all them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And he says in verse 19, he says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on, his, on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast. And them that worshipped his image, those both were cast alive into the lake, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which, uh, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all of the fowls were filled with their flesh. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. Before uh, the pandemic become a pandemic, it was purpose that I preach. Before we found ourselves in this situation, it was purpose that I preach what I'm preaching today. Last week we covered the rapture of the church. This week I'm going to talk to you about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a difference. And we need to know that um, for two purposes. Number one, the sinner needs to hear the gospel. Number two, the church needs to be edified and encouraged that in the end of this thing we win. Come on, saints. If God is for us, say it again. If God is for us, right? Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, I stand behind this sacred desk to preach this gospel message. And I realize that uh, it's a, uh, an awesome obligation. It's a high calling, and I'm very humbled by that. I want you to use me today. Give me wisdom. 
give me compassion, but give me boldness to share the truth of your word. Allow me, Father, to speak exactly what you would have to say to the people that are here, to those that are watching. Let this be a message of a, uh, a warning, but also let it be a message of encouragement. Amen. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Thank you once again for being here with us at Northport Church. Um, last week we, we discussed, and I'm going to give you some basis for this because it's really hard to try to cover two awesome events in two weeks, especially at the, uh, at the behest of just a few minutes, uh, uh, if you would consider the time frame. Um, if you think about this, what we found last week is that the rapture of the church uh, is going to be a period of time where Jesus himself steps out onto the clouds and with the voice of the archangel, he will call home those who, according to Luke 21, and I'm going to say this because Jesus said it, those according to what Luke recorded in Luke 21 who have made themselves worthy. Now let me say this to you. You do not make yourself worthy alone. The way we're made worthy is that we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Bottom line, we have to receive Jesus as our Savior. The way that happens is the Holy Ghost of God will convict our hearts and, and reveal to us that we are a sinner in need of a Savior. We then choose to give our hearts to Jesus and allow Him to cleanse us of our sins. And you say, this is very elementary. Well, hang on. Uh, you uh, allow Him to cleanse us of your sin and come into your heart and be the Lord of your life. And uh, we understand in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are saved by grace through faith in Him and not we of ourselves that it is the gift of God lest any man should boast. Right? Now, you say, well, pastor, you're talking about making yourself worthy. I am talking about that because I'm going to take you from Ephesians 2 and we're going to go to the book of James and we're going to discuss for just a moment James' uh, dialogue when he was discussing uh, faith by works. He says faith without works is dead faith. That's what he says. And he says, if you show me your faith without works, he said, I will show you my faith by my works. What he's referring to is after you and I come to Christ, we are to become examples of Christ to this world. Amen? We are to show Christ to everyone we meet. And listen, sharing and showing the life of Christ is not always one of glamour and fame. I know that's kind of uh, abrupt to say in this uh, starstruck world that we live in because some people feel like, well, if, if, I'm, if, if I'm sharing the gospel, then it's going to be something ritzy and great. Here's the thing. The life of Christ was not always fame. Yes, there were times when the crowds welcomed him. But oh, my friend, may I remind you, there were also times that they didn't welcome him. In fact, there, there were many occasions where they would go to him and say, we need you to leave. There were a lot of occasions they sought to kill him and he would have to slip out in the press. There were times that uh, uh, within a matter of days uh, after they were waving palm branches and honoring him and, and wanting him to be their king, they crucified him. So can I tell you, it's not always going to be easy. Amen? And that is making yourself worthy. According to Scripture. Now I'm going to Scripture. I'm, I'm not going to argue with you what some man has told you as far as religion goes. Because I'm sick past what little bit of hair I got left about religion. The Word of God is what's going to stand when it's all said and done. Amen? It don't matter what mama, pop, and somebody else done or what they told you. You better find out from the book. Amen? Now, he talked about being worthy for the rapture. And he talked about the saints being called away. Now, let me give you a real brief uh, uh, timeline in the book of Revelations. Now, when I say timeline, I'm not giving you dates. I'm giving you a, a, a line of events. In Revelations chapter 1, we know that's the revelation of Jesus to John. It was a fulfillment of God's word 
being, so, uh, being spoken to to the disciples because Jesus said, some of you will not see death until you see the Son of Man come in his glory. They automatically had the ideology that they would be there when he raptured the church. That was not what Jesus meant. Jesus was revealing himself in his glory, the glorified Christ in Revelation chapter 1. Chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation is the revelation of the word to the church ages, to the churches, seven of the 11 churches that were in Asia. Okay? And at the end of those words that was sent to the churches, we see chapter 4 open up. When chapter 4 opens up, what we see there in chapter 4 is John declares, and I heard a voice that said, and he said, I looked into the heavens and I saw a door open unto me. And I heard a voice saying, come up hither, and I will show you things that must come hereafter. Now you need to hold on to that because what's happening is, is John not only uh, uh, shows us in the book of Revelation a symbolism of the rapture, but if you look in the scriptures in Revelation, you don't see the, the church, or rather Christ's church, mentioned again until later in the book, nearly at the end somewhere where we are in chapter 19, and I'll get there in a moment. Now, you're going to see a lot of things take place but it's only after the church is removed that it can happen. What does that say to us, saints? It says that the whole ideology that was given in Scripture, that we are the salt of the earth, salt being a preservative, we are what's keeping this together. It's not by our own good works. It's not by our, our righteousness, but it's the righteousness of Christ in us that we're reflecting to the world that is still holding this together. It's the Spirit of God that has been imparted into us that is fighting against the Spirit of Antichrist and and holding him at bay. There's so much to cover between chapter 4, or rather, really, rather, chapter 5, all the way to chapter 19, and I don't have time to cover it. Um, but I've got to say, say this about it. The Antichrist and what will take place on this earth when he takes power is going to be horrific. Hear me out. If you don't think that the Antichrist is not setting his side of the table in place to have a takeover, then my friend, you're, you're sadly mistaken. Hear me out. Right now, and I'm not making light of this pandemic. I'm not. But listen to me. Right now, you have grown people who are professed born-again believers scared out of their mind, worried to death about what the future holds. I'm not browbeating you, but listen to me. Your future is held in Christ Jesus alone. It's in Christ. Amen? And he has never failed. So understand this. When you see grown people fighting in parking lots over tissue paper, some, they got to be implants from somewhere else. Because Alabamians know we always got tissue paper. I mean, come on. If there's woods, there's tissue paper. Some of us, I ain't going to do it. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> you keep letting these people fight over TP uh, in the parking lots, you'll find out a way. I, I mean, seriously, they're fighting over that. They're panicking. Fear is gripping people. I mean, to the point where I, I know you have to be cautious. The Bible teaches us to use wisdom. But to the point where it's paralyzing our nation. It's paralyzing our planet. And I'm like, you know what? 
I, I, I'm sorry that this is horrible and people are dying. I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm sorrowful of this. But Jesus told us that the, the last days they were going to get worse and worse. Preachers like myself that's been written off and saying, you know, he takes too long, he does this, or he don't, yeah, I don't agree with that. I, you know, we deal with that. But here's the thing. We've been saying for years, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. But you know what's gotten worse? Is the church has gotten worse into living loose, doing whatever feels good, accepting anything that'll come down the pipe and not measuring it with the word of God and saying, you know, it feels really good, so I'm gonna get on board with that. Honey, I don't care how good it makes you feel. Be careful of teachers who heap to themselves people who have itching ears. In other words, to interpret that, who'll tell you anything you want. Be careful. They'll lead you to hell. They'll lead you to hell, and you don't want to go to hell. Now, my point I'm trying to get to about the Antichrist, we will talk about the coming of the Lord, the second coming where he puts his foot on the planet. We'll talk about that in a minute. But i got to get you here. The Antichrist cannot be revealed until the church is removed. That's the book. He cannot be revealed until the church is removed. So in other words, until we are raptured, he can't come onto the scene. But his spirit is already operating. It's already operating. He's operating through fear. He's operating through fear to condition people to get them prepared to follow him when he comes on to the scene. You don't believe me? Let's throw a little pandemic in there. Throw it in there. Let people start dying of a disease that cannot be explained, described, or, 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 or cured and let it be so easy for them to get it. Let's grip their heart with fear. And then let's find a way to lure them right on in and then say, here I have the answer. I got to tell you this, y'all. And this is not going to sound real scripturally. It's not gonna, here's the thing. Anyone who's causing a problem can solve the problem by simply stop doing it. The Antichrist is a, the spirit that is ushering in these diseases, these pandemics. It's all of the spirit of Antichrist because God is a healer. Come on. He's a healer and the Antichrist is everything God's not. So you've got to understand, if the Antichrist is out here, he's, he's dishing out these these diseases, these plagues, these pandemics, all he's got to do is say, all right, y'all stop. His legions of demons and his, his messengers, his, his demon messengers will stop it at his command. Please understand that. He is mimicking what he saw in heaven. He is always going to be a counterfeit of God. I said it earlier, I'll say it again. Any fool can cause a problem and any fool can solve it if they're the ones causing it. I say that in, in reference to how I feel about the Antichrist. Oh, I know he's going to be wise, blah, blah, blah. Here's the, here's the facts. If he can condition you to do anything to get your necessities now, you'll take his mark if you miss the rapture. If you'll fight in a parking lot for toilet paper, you'll do anything for medication. God, help me. I'm not, this is not to incite fear. You need to hear this. China controls 97% of the antibiotics that you and I take on a weekly basis. They control 100% of the ingredients that we utilize to make medications that we live by every day now. 
And people in this country are devastatingly fearful of what might happen if China gets mad at us. You need to think about this for a moment. It's the Antichrist conditioning the world to follow him. You hear me? I hate the devil, and I know that sounds harsh, but I do. If you like him, then me and you got a problem. He is a liar. He is a thief. He's seeking to kill, to steal, and to destroy. I hate it. So therefore, when I read Revelation 19, I get happy in my soul because it gives me some indications that this thing ain't over with some new disease that shows up. In fact, this thing's only over when God is finished with it. How does it work? First of all, Christ is going to return after the tribulation period is over this is when he returns to the earth, but he doesn't come back by himself. He brings the saints with him. Listen to what Jude says in, in Jude uh, verse 14. There's one chapter in Jude, so it's Jude 14. It says, it was about these that Enoch in the seventh generation of Adam prophesied. Lord, or look, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones. Now go back to Revelation 19. In Revelation 19, the uh, Christian Standard Bible says in verse 11, Then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True. It says, And with justice he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knows except he, himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses wearing pure white linen. That He says, a sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will rule them with a rod of iron or an iron rod. He says, he will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God the Almighty. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now think about that. It's telling us that Jesus is going to return someday and when he does, he's going to open his mouth and make war against the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the beast. These will be the ones who are coming out to wage war against God. Can I tell you the Antichrist in his spirit, or rather his spirit, is already waging war against the people of God? Do you not realize that when you open your mouth and you profess to be a Christian, you start professing to follow Jesus, that there'll be people in this world who will despise you already for that? They mock you. They laugh at you. They can't stand you. I'm going to go a little bit further. Even people of different denominations will shun you. I know of a preacher one time that moved to an area that was predominantly a different denomination. I don't want to call the denomination. but uh, He moved to an area where uh, the predominant Christian church in that area was um, a quite a difference in a contrast to the one that the preacher was a part of. The preacher's wife got a job to help supplement their income and uh, her employer after several weeks of enjoying the work, came through and says, now, what church is it your husband is the pastor of? The preacher's wife said, uh, he is church of God. And said so the gentleman looked really shocked and says, oh, okay, walks away. The next day, she didn't have a job. Didn't matter about the work, didn't matter about the 
punctuality, the work ethic. What mattered was is the division in, 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 in properties of faith. Can I tell you this? That is of the spirit of Antichrist who's dividing instead of uniting. Hear me out. Hear me out. He's attacking us every day right now. So in the end of this thing, when Jesus comes back and we, the saints come with him, there's going to be a battle that will ensue. Now, Christ brings back the saints to the earth with him. In Ephesians chapter number 1, verse 10, listen to what it says. It says, as a plan for the right time, the fulfillment of times that is, to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and on earth in him. What he's talking about is when time is fulfilled, Paul was prophesying, and when time is fulfilled in the fullness, Christ will bring things together. In other words, he's working this all together for our good. Can I remind you of this encouragement this morning? According to Matthew 28, 18, all authority has been given to Jesus. He, it's been given to him in heaven and on earth. So there's no power, there's no ruler, there's no sickness, there's no disease that is greater than our God. Can I get a witness to say amen? Amen? Now, let's look into Old Testament prophecy right quick. Old Testament prophecy, Zechariah chapter 14, verses 4 and 5. It says, on that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives will be split in half from east to west, forming a huge valley so that half the mountain will move to the north and half to the south. He says, you will flee by the mountain valley, for the valley of the mountains will extend to Azal, you will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of King Uzziah of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. He's given us a prophecy that Jesus is going to return to this earth and when he gets there at the valley of Megiddo, what we call the valley of Armageddon, there will be a epic war take place. When I say epic, because of the amount of firepower and numbers that the Antichrist will have. It says all nations will come to wage war against Christ and his armies. Listen to me. That is the plan of the Spirit of of Antichrist is to fight you, to fight our God and do everything he can to defeat us. But no nation or no group of united nations will ever stop the armies of the Lord. Can I get a witness to say amen? In Revelation 19, 14, it says that the armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses wearing pure white linen. Now hear this out. Revelation 19 is, is telling us that the King of kings and the Lord of lords is going to appear on a white horse. If you go back into ancient uh, Rome and you do a little study about the Roman government, the Roman government was about conquest, to go out and conquer as many lands as possible and bring it all under one covering. That Roman government had a system of conquering people. Sometimes it was through intimidation. The way it would work is when a Roman general would lead an army out to war, he would go out to war on a white horse. That white horse wasn't just one he grabbed from the stable said this will work. That ain't how it works. In fact, that white horse was a signet, a, a uh, a sign rather, it was a sign to the enemy that we're coming to conquer you and don't worry, we're not concerned about who's gonna win because the white horse stands for victory. 
That means he's coming in victory. If you'll think back, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem the first time, he was on a colt or a donkey, which a general riding in on a donkey saying, I'm coming in peace. But when he shows up on a horse, he's coming back saying, I'm here to fight. Amen? He's coming back on that horse and we are coming back with him on white horses ourselves. <laughs> it's a sign of victory. Somebody say, thank God for victory. Amen? Now, what are we going to do? He's coming to ex execute Pastor Kyle, come. He's coming to execute the great day of wrath. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 15, a sharp sword comes from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will also trample the wine presses of the fierce anger of God the Almighty. He's coming back to wage war against an Antichrist who will have control of the entire world. Can I tell you, sinner, you don't want to miss the rapture. Can I tell you, follower of Christ, Christian or saint, whatever you want to go by, you don't want to miss the rapture. If you're, if you're already gripped with fear or panic about this pandemic, you let someone as evil as the Antichrist come. And listen to this. Where there's no holy people, there's no, there's no spirit of God. Oh. You let that be the case. I've read Revelation several different times and, and uh, when I read that about woe unto them who, who are with child and their child gets sucked. I'm talking about with babies. If you'll fight for toilet paper, you let your baby get sick. And they say, we got the medication, we got the cure for them, but you're going to have to take this to get it. You're going to have to take this mark. You're going to have to, play, you're going to, have to give your allegiance to the one world order. And can I say this? He's not going to be called the Antichrist, y'all. They're not going to say, oh, that's the Antichrist. You know who will be, uh, I'm gonna go, well, let me preach right there for a minute. You know who's going to be saying, oh, that's the Antichrist, that's the Antichrist, that's the Antichrist? It's the lukewarm, cold Christians who's not made themselves ready. Revelation, uh, uh, let me back up. Matthew 25. Ten virgins. Ten virgins. Five were wise, five were foolish. There was, at midnight, a cry was made. It says, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. It said, They all rose and trimmed their lamps. And said, The five wise, as they trimmed their lamps, they got up and proceeded to go to meet the bridegroom. But the five foolish, they realized that their lamps had gone out. They said to the wise, give us of your oil so that our, our lamps could be lit, lit and burning. They said, no, there's not enough for us and for you. In other words, what I've got is not good enough for me and you both. But go to those that sell and buy and then come. While they did so, the bridegroom appeared, received those who were wise, and then closed the door. Those foolish ones come running back saying, open to us. We're virgins like the rest. But they weren't ready. Those are the ones that's going to be saying during the tribulation, that's the Antichrist, that's the Antichrist, that's the Antichrist. There's going to be preachers preaching. Not every preacher is going to make it. In fact, I can give you statistics from Scripture. It's about a 50%. It says there's going to be two in the city. One will be taken, the other left. There's going to be two walking down a road. There's going to be one taken, the other one's going to be left. There's going to be two lying in the bed. One taken, one left. You want to talk about panic? You want to talk about a pandemic? 
You want to talk about fear? When the church is gone, when people that you know that you used to sit in the aisle with are gone, when fear is going to grip. Here's the encouragement. If you read the rest of chapter 19, you'll find that when the Lord opens his mouth, the word of God as a sharp sword will come out and it will destroy the Antichrist, his armies. It'll defeat them. I love what it says. It says that the false prophet and the beast are taken captive and cast into the, into the flames of brimstone. One says sulfur. I call it hell. They're going to be just right off the bat. Good. But it don't just stop there. The victory is not complete. Not yet. What happens next is amazing, and I love, I love reading it just because I like reminding Satan. Revelations 20, and if you'd stand all over the building, I'll land the plane. Revelations 20, verse 1 through 3. It says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding a key to the great abyss and a great chain in his hand. He sees the dragon, that old ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan. And he bound him for a thousand years and he threw him into the abyss and closed it and put a seal on it so that it would no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years were completed. And it says, and after that it must be released for a short time. <laughs> a thousand years. Here's the encouragement to you. That old devil's been giving you a fit. The old devil, the accuser of the brethren keeps bringing your past up. Keep saying you're not good enough. You ain't fit for nothing. An unnamed angel is sent and dispatched. He's got a key in one hand, Pat, and got a chain in the other. Slings it around. The devil drags him over the pit, throws the key in there and opens it up and kicks him in the backside. Get in there, boy. Slams the door shut. <laughs> and then the millennial reign. That's a thousand years that we rule and reign with Christ. How can I be in on that? The Bible says if you're faithful over a few things, he'll make you ruler over many. In that millennial reign, your faithfulness will be rewarded. Huh? Well, you don't get a lot of shouting over that, do you? You should. You ought to shout and run all over the house. For those times the enemy says, now go ahead and skip on this one. Go ahead and ease out on that one. Go ahead and throw in the towel and cuss a little bit. Go ahead and get drunk and sleep around. And you say, no, I'm committed to not only my, my family and my spouse, but I'm committed to Christ. That's being faithful. Huh? The second coming is this. It's different from the rapture. It's when the war is going to take place on this planet that's going to end all wars. That's the second coming. Here's the warning to sinners. If you're not in Christ, you're not going to make the rapture at all. In fact, most likely if you're not in Christ, you'll follow blindly right along with the rest of the world. You'll accept the mark of the beast and you'll be a part of his. Heaven will never be yours pretty strong isn't it but if you're in Christ you've made yourself worthy go back to Revel or go back to Luke chapter 21 he said for those that have made themselves worthy worthy have been given a way of escape of these terrible things in other words for those that's lived right they got saved and like James said they're not living by faith alone but they're living by working in faith in other words, after they got saved, they worked for God. They served God. They loved God. They stayed in there with God. Those people found a way of escape from all these things. That's Bible. If you want to give your heart to Jesus today, today's the day. In fact, the business, 
you don't want to take a chance of trying to make it after the rapture. You don't want to. Today's the day of salvation. The Holy Ghost is here with us. The Spirit that's drawing us is here now. To the saint, it's no time to be lukewarm. It's no time to be complacent. Sitting around on your laurels thinking, oh, how holy you are, and you ain't shook a stick at a snake in years. You ain't told anybody about Jesus. You won't read his word. In fact, you find everything else to replace him. And if you'll throw in a little prayer over your meal, or if you'll listen to a little bit of contemporary or, or, or some type of gospel music, you're good. That's complacency. And in the book of Revelation chapter 3, it talks about if we're lukewarm, that we make God sick. Even now I stand at the door and knock. For I, the Lord, have been making a place ready for you, for my people, for those that would accept me. I'm preparing that place and it's soon complete. I'm awaiting the, the charge. I'm awaiting my Father's words to send me to go and to receive you, my people, my church, my bride. Oh, I've longed to hold you. I've longed to love you. I've longed to keep you. I say even now is the day of salvation prepare for I'm soon coming. For I'm knocking at your heart's door. I'm pleading. Allow me to come in. Allow me, the Lord, your Lord, to be the God of your life. If you will allow me, I'll make all things new. For I am capable of it. I am the beginning and the end. And I have a change, says the Lord. Would you lift your hands up and just honor the Holy Ghost in this house? If you're in this house, I'm not asking for a show of hands uh, using trickery or anything like that, a manipulation. But if you're in this house and you're not ready to meet Jesus, if that's you, get out from where you are and run to the altar right now. Don't wait around. Come on. If you're in this place and you're not ready to meet him, you better get here quick. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Say, Pastor, I'm, I'm ready. Well, is your family ready? Are they? I'm asking because if they're not ready, what are you doing to help them get that way? You need to pray for your family. Come on up here and let's get some praying done. What about our communities? Our communities are still plagued with more strip joints and more uh, liquor stores and, and more tarot card readers than ever. There's killing every day. And we've just gotten used to it. We've gotten okay with it. As long as it don't hit us or bother us, it's all right. Are we praying for our community? Let me ask you this. Are you praying for your nation? Are you praying for the president? Are you praying for the Congress? Are you praying for the Senate? Y'all, our nation was built on godly principles, but our government's not reflecting it. And so I'm calling on us, the church, we're supposed to be what makes a difference. I'm calling on the church to pray for our nation. In fact, while we're praying, I want to encourage you this. Remember the scriptures that teaches us that when two or three are gathered together in his name, he'll be there? Do you remember the scripture that it also teaches us that if two will touch and agree upon any one thing that it shall be done? Could I get some people that would agree with me to curse this sickness that's come upon this planet? 
to curse it and cause it to die? Could I get anybody to declare with me Psalms 91 that no plague will come nigh my dwelling, that no plague will touch my family, will no plague will touch my city, no plague will touch my home, no plague will touch, come on somebody, curse that plague. Can I get somebody that would agree, say, God, give us wisdom. Give our leaders wisdom. Give our communities a sense of peace and not fear. Can I get somebody to do that? You keep praying, I'm going to read something to you. For those of you that's got to go and hurry and get to your next uh, assignment, I understand. But for those of you that could be, uh, could spare me another two to three minutes to allow me to read this, I need to read something to you. I'm going to place this online here in just a little bit. It'll be something that you can share. It'd be something I'd encourage you to copy and paste, put it in your phone, because it's an encouragement to the believers today. Les Higgins friend of mine. I've served with uh, Bishop Higgins and his family personally. He's been in this pulpit before since I've been here. He's preached here many times before in the past. He wrote a blog and he shared it. This is what it's titled, But the Church Prayed. It says, The outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost set in motion a tidal wave of evangelism and, and miraculous manifestation of the power of God throughout the world. Believers were filled with boldness and proclaimed the message of Jesus with signs following. The infant church was off to a blazing start. This magnificent beginning did not happen, however, without intense opposition. Persecution of the followers of Jesus Christ became the order of the day. An example of this persecution is found in Acts chapter 12. King Herod killed James and because it, this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter. Peter was placed in prison with the, uh, the plan to present him to an angry and threatening populace after the Passover. It seems there is an all-out attack against the leadership of the church. The church of Jesus Christ did not have any political clout. There were by no means the majority. Their ability to maneuver through uh, these attacks in the legal system or to even public opinion did not exist. They did, however, have a source of power that the world could not counteract. Verse 5 of Acts 12 tells us that the church prayed. This consistent prayer or constant prayer offered to God by the church brought divine intervention. Peter was miraculously delivered from prison. This would be the only one of many times help would come through prayer. Throughout history, the people of God have encountered great challenges, but when they prayed, God moved on their behalf. In the Old Testament, Israel was surrounded and attacked by enemy nations, but they prayed and God delivered them. God's people came under the authority of wicked kings and governments who bought or brought idols and all kinds of perversion to the forefront, but they prayed and God intervened. They faced times of famine and pestilence, but they prayed and God provided and protected. They failed God and turned away from Him, but they prayed and repented and God restored them. They followed God's directions and built a tabernacle in which He would dwell. And as they prayed, fire fell from heaven and the presence of God went with them. In the New Testament, the church faced immense persecution, but they prayed and God sustained them. They faced times of great need, but they prayed, and God miraculously provided. They faced times of controversy and question, but they prayed, and God gave wisdom and direction. They faced times of sickness, even death, but they prayed, and God healed and restored life. They had times of intense hunger for God and they prayed and God sent revival. Once even praying until the place shook where they were all gathered together. There are many examples in our lifetime of great challenge and attack on various fronts. 
but we are still here because we prayed. Prayer has been both a defensive and offensive weapon that has never failed to produce victory. Praying people have always overcome. Today we find ourselves in uncharted water. Our battles are more intense and our enemy seems more sophisticated. Some have lost hope and assumed the best days, our best days are behind us. Like those captured by the Babylonians in Psalms 137. They are convinced the song of the Lord will never be sung again. That it's over. But I see an army rising up that refuses to take a, the defeatist approach. They recognize this may be a season of great trial, but it is also a season to be the people of God. Just as other generations have faced tests, this is their test. It's only a test. This will not depend on their abilities and strengths. They will not be moved by what others are doing. They will find victory where it has always been found. They will pray. Every believer can be a part of this praying army. No circumstance or situation will be a match for those who are committed to prayer. Like those before us, our story will be marked by an enemy assault. But it will also tell of a powerful conquest because the church prayed. Today's been declared as a national day of prayer. I know you want to leave. But we need to pray. Can you in your mind recall men like Elijah who walked in as an outcast in a city that or into a country that once embraced him and the God of their forefathers who had now went after another God and put prophets of Baal and prophets of the grove in charge of the religion. And here comes one man that had the audacity to stand up and say, why are we caught between an opinion like this? Why would we go after such fake, false, counterfeit gods? Why would we go after something that's powerless, useless, hopeless? He challenged those prophets. In fact, of business, the man of God made fun of those prophets. Laughed at them. Said, where is your God? Surely he's gone on a journey or something because he would have surely answered by now. He built an altar according to the standards of Scripture. He put it all together. He dug a trench around about the altar. Had multiple gallons of water brought in and poured over the sacrifice and the wood and it ran down and filled the trench with water. He then bowed his knee and he prayed. And God sent fire from heaven down and it not only consumed the sacrifice, but it licked the dust and the water out of the trenches. Consumed it because the man of God prayed. Do you remember times like Acts 12? Simon Peter was about to be killed. He was about to be beheaded because it would be it would be fun for the crowd after all to see another one of these pesky old preachers die but the church prayed did you hear that it wasn't just the man of God it was the church the Bible says brother Shane that prayer was made without ceasing of the church they kept praying all night Joel they said I ain't giving up God's going to do something I don't know how Dwayne I don't know how they prayed it just says they prayed do you think somebody in the room may have had uh, uh, the, the thought, God open the prison doors and let him walk out? I don't know what happened. The Bible just said the church prayed and an angel of God walked in, kicked Peter on the side and said, boy, get up. There's work for you to do. And Brother Mike, they walked right out of that prison <laughs> because the church prayed. Can I get you to pray with me? Let's get a hold of God. Just right wherever you are in your own way with your family there, just husbands, put your arm around your wives. Put your hands on your kids. If you don't have family here, just, just, just know that you're wrapped up in the Holy Ghost right now. Let Him help you. Let's pray.
Like a bride waiting for her groom, we'll be the church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing like a bride. So come, Lord Jesus, come. So we wait, we wait for you. God, we wait, your come. get a hold of God pray again pray again to the place shakes again pray again to the Holy Ghost that's, that, that you once had that once used to be a passion, a fire inside Jesus. of you yes. pray again until yes. it becomes a blaze again Pray again until you get so hungry for God and what His good things are. Pray again until it becomes everything to you. Pray again. Pray again. Pray again. To your family is united again. Pray again to your children come home from out of the pigs, the, the pig parlors. Pray again to the restored. Church of God, folks, I'm going to hit you with something you need to hear. Pray again until your children are baptized in the Holy Ghost. Pray again until they have the goods. Tell them about the good things of God. Tell them about the Holy Ghost. Let them see Him operate in your life. Oh, I'm not talking about just speaking in tongues and, 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 and jumping around in front of them, but I'm talking about walking in the gifts of the Spirit, walking and producing the fruit of the Spirit. Because, my God, they're living in a world that you and I can't even imagine. They're seeing things that we never dreamed would happen. They're seeing it happen right before their eyes, and they're, they're questioning. They're questioning who they are. They're questioning who, they, who they're going to become. Is there even going to be a world left? You need to prepare them for the world to come. I'd love nothing more to see my little grandbaby grow up, but I don't know that it's going to happen in this world. I believe Jesus is coming. He's coming. I believe the world that he'll get to grow up in is the world that's perfect by God. Amen? And that'll be all right. But I plan to be there. And if the Lord happens to tarry, that boy will know everything I can teach him about God. Everything I can teach him about walking in the Spirit, Leon Doss. Everything I can show him in the Scripture about being a man of God. That's what I'm going to do. Father, do it again. Do it again. Set us ablaze again. Set us ablaze again. Set us ablaze again. In Jesus' name. Hear the word of the Lord. The Lord declares, I will hear your prayers. 
if you would humble yourselves before me like you once would do. I will not only hear your prayers, but I would respond to them. I would bring healing to your people, to your lands, if only you would humble yourselves before me again. If you would just call to me and turn away from the wickedness that controls your heart, that it's exposed in your attitudes, if you would humble yourselves before me, you would see the Lord your God work in great power and authority because I, the Lord, have not changed. I, the Lord, am God. Would you lift up your hands right now and honor the Holy Ghost? Thank you, Holy Ghost of God. God, move. Move. God, move in this nation. Move in this nation. Oh, God. Let your people experience revival through this attack. Oh, God, let us see you. Let us see you move. Let us see you be God in every circumstance. Oh, holy God in heaven. Holy God of heaven. Holy God of heaven. Move again. Father, we're sorry for tolerating and allowing sin to be rampant to go unchallenged. We're sorry, God, for allowing our assemblies, assemblies together. Instead of it being a time of worship, it's more of an entertainment for us. It's not about your glory. Forgive us, oh God. God, condition our hearts to be set on you. Condition us to be set on you. honor him today. I want you to remember the words of the Holy Ghost. I want you to remember the words of Bishop Bless Higgins. I want you to remember the words of your pastor. Jesus is coming. He's not coming back after just any old church. He's coming back after a bride who's made herself ready that's spotless and without blemish been clothed in the righteousness of Christ that's who he's coming after you don't want to miss it be ready be ready amen I love each of you you guys are awesome 
I bless you in Jesus' name. I declare Psalms 91 over you and your family. You're going to be protected and sheltered under the wings and the shadow of the Almighty. Would you receive that declaration today? Remember, no hugging outside of your family. No hugging on each other. No handshakes. We're going to use wisdom. Listen, it just do us a favor not to, to go ahead and accept some practices like that. Because folks coming up in here with the flu, I ain't liking that either. Huh? If you're sick, stay home and watch us online. We got it online. You can give online. You can be a part of this online. You can, you can huck and buck in, in your living room. And when you get better, come running in here and dare some of us to catch up with you. Be practice up at home, okay? I love you. I bless you in Jesus' name.